at my mother's behest for piano lessons with Mrs. Tull, who had been a professional classical pianist. What my, was my mother thinking was going to happen with that? In other words, Texas is where my mother's boundless dreams for me took flight. It's also where I learned to think that people could and should try in whatever way they can to make life better for others alive today and for those to come. That this feeling, this thought came to me in a place that was at once so very difficult, so full of good things, and so full of potential shaped my thinking and actions in important ways. About the difficulties of Texas, Love does not require taking an uncritical stance toward the objects of one's affections. In truth, it often requires the opposite. We can't be of real service to the hopes we have for places and people, ourselves included, without a clear-eyed assessment of their and our strengths and weaknesses. That often demands a willingness to be critical, sometimes deeply so. How that is done matters, of course. Striking the right balance can be exceedingly hard. I hope I've achieved the proper equilibrium. Thank you. And so, I wanted to end on that note to sort of reassure people. <laughs> I, the Texans and family members and people that I knew would be reading this, uh, that this is not a hate fest by mentioning all of the problems that exist in Texas, along with some of the good things, that are, that are the fun things, the crazy things. I love the craziness of the place in lots of ways, the outsized nature of it. Uh, but to talk really about a larger question, about not just Texas, but about the United States. We're in a very difficult time at this moment. And how we feel about the place, what we want to sacrifice, how do we want to continue to hope for it, and what steps we're willing to take to make sure that the experiment goes better, goes on, goes forward in a better way, will come out of a sense of responsibility towards it, even as it breaks our heart in lots of ways. And that's the Texas story. In a lot of ways, that's the American story. So that's what I wanted to get off my chest in writing this book. And I will come back to Texas at some point in a different kind of way, probably not personal, <laughs> I would say. but. Uh, in a way that tries to show it as a place that's really, in some ways, quintessentially American. It has some of the points I make in the book is that it starts out as a diverse place. It's not, it didn't have to become diverse. It starts out with indigenous people, um, at people of African descent. Um, in the 1500s, with the Spanish, you know, it's not necessary to start this story with the English. The Spanish were there <laughs> before, and that's a part of the story as well. And we need to have a much more encompassing, much more broadly face based look at the United States to understand who we, who we come, come from, all the people we come from, Europeans, Africans, indigenous people all together. So with that, I'd like to take any questions you might have. No questions? <laughs> Uh, you use the term cowboys, mm -hmm. and I just read that the term evolved, and I wonder whether it, it's true. <clears throat> Most of the ranch hands were black initially in the West and referred to as boy, mm -hmm. and that was where the term cowboy came from. Is that I, I don't know that that's, it, it isn't, it's possible certainly, but even with the Spanish, or Caros, they, they were um, the equivalent of cowboys before then, and a good number of the cowboys were, were black, that's right, as, and I see in the book, even though cowboy is seen now as a, synonymous with a white man, uh, lots of the cowboys were in fact, were, were in fact black, and certainly Latino as well. So. I don't know about the about that part of it. I'm sort of assuming that you didn't do a lot of traveling before you came to Dartmouth. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm wondering what was it about growing up in Texas that um, prepared you for being a young black woman in New England and kind of learning answer? Well, I don't know that it prepared me. <laughs> well, it didn't prepare me. <laughs> didn't prepare. Well, it didn't depart. Well. It was, I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to go away 
the idea of college away in New England, the sort of romanticized version of what all of that meant. I didn't want to go to a big school. We were talking yesterday about Stanford was the second choice for me, and I could have gone, I could have met my husband there, because that's where he went undergrad. But um, the idea of being away in a small New England town appealed to me. And being away from school, being away from it all. Uh, I didn't grow up in a big town. I don't know why I thought I, why I wanted to go to another. I just didn't think I was prepared for a city yet. And so I didn't, you know, apply to Harvard. I didn't apply to Columbia or any of those places. I just wanted to be away in New England at school. It just, it's, there's the romance of it. I, you know, when you're 17, so, you know, you know, who knows why you come up with these kinds of things. And my father was enthusiastic about it for one reason or another. I heard from a lot of schools. Um, I did well on my P, you know, PSAT and the SATs, and so it, everybody was writing. And so he was reading. I didn't realize this, but he was paying attention to all of these things. And it was something about the, their approach to me as a, as a student that really attracted him, and I think that influenced me as well. And I didn't prepare, I was, I was telling yesterday, I wasn't prepared for the days that ended at 3.30 or 4 in the winter. I didn't think, I mean, I just, I knew it was in the north, but I didn't, I just never thought about what that meant, and the sun that was sort of always over there was never over your head. I was like, I, this is strange. So there were, there were things, I wasn't prepared for that, but the small town nature of it, because I'd grown up in a small town, small towns are pretty much, pretty much the same. The people, you know, you know how far you can go and how far you can't go, and, and so that was really familiar to me. The, the urban setting would have been much more difficult, I think, at that, at that stage. I just wanted to, to thank you for um, so much work. When I was getting my master's um, in history, my professor um, used your first book, uh, the Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings story in American controversy. And it really changed the way that I looked at how stories are told. And the fact that so many New England historians were not willing to see that Thomas Jefferson could have had a child with Sally Hemings, in fact, contorted themselves in all kinds of positions to not make that so. And you have changed, you've changed the field. And I just, I, I had to tell you that in your biography of Andrew Jackson, uh, Andrew Johnson is amazing. And I just, for those of you who don't study history, this woman has changed the field. And I just, I need you to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, similarly, um, in the early 2000s, I had a professor assign your book on Jefferson and Hemings. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as a young man, I was less culturally aware at the time. but. With everything going on in the resistance, you see to things like the 1619 Project. Did you experience a lot of criticisms for, you know, what many people I assume would have seen as like a, uh, you know, a challenge to traditional notions of what American meant uh, when you first put that out? Well, I mean, I I had some resistance, not as much as I thought there was going to be. I thought that the, it would be much more virulent. Uh, a woman named Fawn Brody wrote a book about Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings. We talk, wrote a biography of Jefferson and sort of incorporated Hemings into the story in 1974. She got a really, really virulent, a tough response. I mean, there were people who were hostile. There are still some people who are hostile, but for the most part, I think the historical, when you say the historical profession had you know, come to a point where they didn't think it was real, but it was not, they're not, you know, with pitchforks or anything like that. I mean, being attacking, you know, attacking people in certain ways. It's just that it was taken as, as, a, as a story that had been told that wasn't likely true, and it wasn't that important. I think that's really what it was, is that it, people didn't see that it's very difficult to add a woman and seven children for to live to adulthood to a person's biography and not change what's going on in that place. You know, you're reading about Ellen and all of them at Poplar Forest going along, and you, you find out, if you look at the letters, that Madison and Eston and Beverly are along with them. So here's your grandfather with you when you're telling these nice stories about them. He also has his three 
illegitimate enslaved children <laughs> along with you, that's a different picture. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, to think that it's not, people thought it wasn't important, that it was just sort of a sex scandal mm -hmm. because it involved you know, an African-American person. And so they, it can't be, this is just a sex thing and this is period for us to talk about it uh, without getting at the, the point that what it says about the institution of slavery, it's not just you know, making people work for no money or whipping people, it's blended families. It's people, Jefferson's wife has six enslaved half siblings and she brings them with her to Monticello and you just think, what was that like? I mean, I can't, the only people who, novelists are the only people who can tell that story or the playwrights can tell that story. But to know that it's there, even describing when they talk about Jefferson going to France and say, saying, well, he went with his servant James, or just a servant, sometimes he even mention the name, but James, if you describe him as Martha's half-brother, and then you, it explains a lot of his behavior towards them, towards James and, and Robert. Sometimes he doesn't know where they are. They're sort of wandering off and you know, hiring their own time and keeping their own money. Think, what's going on here? You know, what, how, why are they different than these other people? But if you see that familial connection, you understand why that's a possible answer to this story as to why these people are so different. So long answer to this to say it's not it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but I think I think it's because people had sort of moved to the point that it was not just some vigorous insult, it's just that there's an irrelevancy. And we don't think it happened, but it's not even that important even if it did. And now that we're trying to tell the stories of other people and a, a broader sense of what Monticello was about and slavery was about, then it becomes important. You see that the story in a different way. It, it seems, I, I read several of your books and, and, and I, I, I agree that the way you tell the Henning story is just uh, revelatory in, in a way that has changed um, the way that, that, that some people certainly think about Jefferson. But it seems to me that you also approach history from a very different angle than uh, historians, American history people were looking at the story of America back when I was in college, for example. I mean, then it was big ideas. It was, uh, it was the Constitution. It was the format for government. It, it, it was the it was the pilgrims or it was the puritans or it was the quakers sort of the influences that made the country what it supposedly was mm -hmm. and one of the things that i i just totally love about your writing is the way at least in in the hemingses and monticello so much is told through people and the information you have, or in some cases you don't have, mm -hmm. about who the people were and the interactions that, that they had. I'm wondering if, if, if you think the teaching of American history in American universities has changed demonstrably in the last 30, 40 years, partly because of historians like you, who I think are focusing more on people and the way society is affected by the people in it and sort of the other way around. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think talking about people, history from the bottom up, that kind of thing has been in vogue for, for a time, for a good while. Uh, they're still talking about ideas and people, but I think that they're more, there is more young graduate students, people, there are lots of folks who are interested in finding untold stories and talking about marginalized people. There's definitely more of that. I don't think the old, it hasn't gone away, totally, but it's been broadened. And I think a lot of people are not, some people aren't happy about that. Um, that it's, to, it's at the expense of thinking about bigger ideas, but that's, that's still there. It's just that the, the pool has gotten bigger. <laughs> you know, the, the pool of stories and subject matters has gotten much larger. I think it's, they complement one another, actually. I mean, that's the, the idea. You have to have both of those things, the one to the exclusion of the other. That's why it's good to have 
you know, more people, different types of people doing it, thinking about things from a different perspective. I'm interested in people. I grew up reading biographies, and, I, and I've discovered times through people. One of my favorite books, uh, Experiment in Autobiography by H.G. Wells, uh, who used to be a really, really famous person. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we know who he is now, and we know more of the worlds, but I mean, he was, in his time, I mean, the most famous man in the world, one of them besides Chaplin, maybe. But it's a great, and I read that as a, as a teenager, and it, it struck me, it was so modern. Here's a person who's born, you know, in the 19th century, and it's his writing and his, uh, the way he tells stories and talks about himself, all those kinds of things are just, you know, I, I go back and look at it periodically because I just think, it, it, for me, it was a very, very influential thing. Um, so that's, my approach comes from the things that I've been doing since, you know, from a teenager, is looking at people in a particular moment of time and how they explain themselves and what they think they're doing. And so it was natural for me to do that, um, that that would, that would have to be my approach. Because I, I do think it makes, one of, one of the things I didn't like about my kids' history education, they had great education in lots of ways, but I don't think their teachers did it, talked to them enough about people. And they didn't make the subject of history um, alive for them. You know, they were doing, they were talking about, you know, the insular cases and treaties and all that. And I'm thinking, why in middle school are you doing this? Do you know who Frederick Douglass was? Uh, do you know who these people are? And this is a way, and you start with that, and then you can sort of broaden out to other areas. Uh, and I think that's why I meet so many people who say, I hated history when I was in school. And they don't really learn to love it until much later on. But I think if you were prepared through that, introducing people and their times, and then moving on to the next phase where you talk about ideas and so forth, that that would be really helpful. Can I just ask, where, where you are? Are you a fan of Lincoln Stephens? Uh, yes. <laughs> the autobiography of Lincoln Stephens yeah, is yeah, one of my all-time favorite yeah, books. No. He was, he was amazing. Another person who was incredibly famous and yeah. is pretty much unknown now. Um, well, you read your book and listened to it too. It was wonderful to you both. Um, you were, were history in your small town when you went to that uh, desegregated school. What? So you're part of history. What? And you kind of answered it with the previous question. But what sparked you on your path to love history? I think that that did. That was certainly a part of it. Um, I had an understanding that what was going on was historic. And I also think it, it helped me think about law even early on because I understood that the, the law was involved. I didn't understand exactly how, but I, I knew that this was a process that was taking place in courts and the courts had a, had a role to play in it. But I, I definitely think that that experience and also the experience growing up in a segregated place, you know, going to the movies and sitting in the balcony and going to a doctor's office and sitting in a separate waiting room. Um, you wonder why is that? How did this come about? Where did this come from? So, because it wasn't a natural, it didn't make sense to me, you know, um, and so I think that is really the, the society, the school was important, but the, the segregated society, trying to figure out what that was about, pointed me to, to history. Because it pointed me to slavery, and I understood that this was something that was an outgrowth of that, and people's attitudes towards black people. And so it, it was a natural, natural subject. I, I was just thinking about what you're talking about way and stories of people as opposed to just concepts and how that applied to my experience of reading the book Cast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the reasons I think she's the author of such an amazing writer is because she's found that balance between concepts <laughs> you know, and looking at the lens through which we viewed history and she balances it with stories about people and honestly I it's 
that the stories about people that have been subjected to so much violence with the racism is extremely difficult to read, which is probably why we don't see it in print more. So I have found it easier to, to uh, absorb all the historic information she has of comparing how the Nazis analyzed American law, the basis of racism, and how the untouchables in India were so connected to key uh, people in America <laughs> that were fighting racism. Uh, so I can get intellectually involved, and then she'll give a small vignette of a certain lynching or something like that. And it's like, wow. <laughs> And then I, just going back to the intellectual piece makes it a little easier to absorb the uh, other. Yeah. Well, she's fantastic, fantastic person and, and a fantastic writer. And it does, it helps you figure these things out. I mean, it helps you see the point of it and the stories, because you can empathize with people. And that's what you're looking for to try to, to get people to understand you know, what would it be like to be treated this way and to be stuck in a system that is difficult to get out of and it makes it explain it explains why it's been so hard to get out of it as well. Yeah, hi. Um, so with everything that, that has been going on in this country, one of the biggest talking points was has been this idea of critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, in your home still Texas, there was a bill that was introduced um, aiming to teach Texas history. Uh, patriotic history, and I was just wondering about you know uh, what's your um, belief um, beliefs or just you know thoughts on that, and whether or not you see any sort of you know connections between some of some of, the, some of your works with um, the Hemings and your book on Juneteenth that was just recently made a major holiday. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the critical race theory controversy sort of come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty clear that it was manufactured. I mean, critical race theory. One of the founders of that movement was a classmate of mine at Harvard. Uh, she's in my section, actually, Kim Crenshaw, along with her mentor, Derek Bell, who was also at Harvard. Um, and it's a law school topic. It's not even in all law schools, actually. Um, it's about how law is, the sort of racism is embedded in law and the structure of law and why passing individual laws don't really don't seem to change things that much. I mean, they change things some, but not as much as people hope for it. And what you have to do is to sort of really look in and see how it's embedded in law. And that's a, it's a difficult, it's not a, com, a concept for kindergartners. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it's hard for me to imagine that a lot of K through 12 mm -hmm. people are actually teaching critical race theory. You know, and what it means is that all talk about race is critical race theory. Mm -hmm. So all critical race theorists talk about race, but not all people who talk about race are critical race theorists. Mm -hmm. And they've made it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can't talk about the idea is that you're not supposed to talk about race because it makes, it might make white children feel bad to know that their great great grandparents used to go to lynchings, yeah. you know, or did, you know, or did things, and why, it's, it fascinates me, the idea that, but there was a complaint about the um, a sort of child's biography of Ruby Bridges, mm -hmm. because they had a, a crowd of white people standing outside the school yelling, mm -hmm. well, they were, mm -hmm. they did that, that happened, mm -hmm. and there was a white teacher who taught her, you know, continued to teach her, so, but they didn't want, <laughs> parents were upset because it made white people look bad, but why not identify with the teacher? Yeah. Why do you assume that they would identify with the people out the mob? And they wouldn't. And the question is, do you not want them to revile those people? I mean, what is it that, are you upset that they think that those people were doing something wrong? And why would they not identify with the teacher? So a lot of it is, you know, very interesting. It's a very instructive about current day attitudes about race, wanting to maintain the hierarchy. You don't want things that sort of break it down. You don't want your kids to think about things in a different way. 
And uh, we'll see what happens with that. Some of that stuff has to be unconstitutional. I mean, it will be challenged. We'll see how far they go with it. But for Texas, you know, how do you talk about the Republic of Texas without looking at the Constitution that promotes slavery and says black people can't live there, black people can't become citizens, you're gonna redact that from the, from the, in the class, you take those provisions out. So I think it's a culture war stuff. I mean, it's essentially a manufactured controversy to keep people's minds off of other more pressing issues that we have. Anytime that happens, someone says culture war, and they can count on people to come out and complain about things that they don't, don't even really understand. You know, critical race theory is not, I mean, the sort of anti-racism um, curriculum that people complain about is not critical race theory. The anti-racism people believe that you can teach individual people not to be racist. The critical race theorists say it's not about individuals. Mm -hmm. It's about a system. So they're not, they're really not together. <laughs> you know, they're talking about race, but they're talking about race in a different kind of way. And, um, yeah, and I, I do think that people are, it's sort of a backlash because teachers have been talking more about race, talking more about uh, Native peoples and so forth, and that makes people uncomfortable. So I, I think it's a manufactured crisis. We'll have to see how it goes. We have so many other issues, um, serious problems um, that to attend to, and that's, in my book, is not one of them. 1619, you know, I think it's another area where they fixated on one, a couple of sentences in the project uh, that in some ways she has walked back anyway about, you know, 1619 is the real founding of the country, not 1776, and it's both of them. I mean, both of 1619 informs 1776. It created, it was the part of the society that existed. The existence of slavery was part of, you know, the American founding, and people had to argue about that. There was a compromise over it, so it's not, it was not a non-issue. So both of them worked together, and I think she has, um, Hannah Jones has, you know, said that that was more of a rhetorical flourish than anything, but people took it and ran with it. And you, you know what happened with her, the, the fiasco in North Carolina, and her now at Howard. Um, so um, both of them, it's a way of diverting people's attention, I think, from real, real problems. So in your uh, current work with students at Harvard, um, what are you most encouraged by in terms of what you see people in their early 20s and their intellectual development pursuits? Uh, their enthusiasm, their commitment. They like to do stuff. I mean, young, they want to be involved in things. There, there, there are a million projects they have. They're involved in you know, public interest things. They're involved in NGOs. I think it's their, their commitment to action. They are very, very, and, and my daughter's generation, of, my daughter well, could be at home, she's not in law school, but um, you know, after the last, the election, 2016 election, I mean, she became galvanized politically. She started you know, bundling money for candidates, and one of her friends ran for office and won as a state rep in New York. And she's just, they have been, they're on fire in a lot of ways about politics and about running for office and being part of it, and you know, school boards, all kinds of things in ways that we, we were not. I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, we were political, but we, I don't think people thought that becoming a part of running for office and doing those kinds of things matter. I think they do because they realize that sort of uh, hesitancy about it allowed a lot of people who you know, are doing some of the things that we don't feel so great about now to take those places. And it should be a competition. You know, there should be you know, Democrats and Republicans, all kind, liberals and conservatives participating in the system and not just turning it over to one group of people, that's not the way to go. So I am, I am heartened by their commitment, their sense of commitment and their enthusiasm about things. Well, thank you very much.